As we look forward to final events, as we anticipate the second coming of Jesus, what prophetic role, if any, does the modern state of Israel play? Is its establishment, as so many preachers declare, central to events preceding the second coming? Or could it merely be a distraction? Uh, the next few opportunities that, that I have to preach, I would like to look at some of the issues facing the church and particularly Seventh-day Adventists as we face final events, as we look forward to the second coming with regard to the place of Israel, the modern state of Israel, the political entity of Israel, as we think about uh, and hear so much about Antichrist and uh, the rapture. Um, it's important, I think, that we understand these things Especially if, in the understanding of them, we receive the spiritual lessons that we need to learn from God's Word that will prepare us for whatever may lie ahead. Uh, last night, because I checked, three preachers in a row on TBN focused on Israel and of God's activities in Israel and around Israel, of Israel's role and finally events, as we anticipate the rapture, as we anticipate the coming of Antichrist, a, a secular power, a covenant established with the Jews, the rebuilding of the temple after the Jews have taken the Temple Mount and destroyed the Dome of the Rock. Uh, and then finally, Messiah himself, standing on the Mount of Olives and reigning for a thousand years. So what does the Bible say? What, what is the truth about Israel in the last days? First of all, to understand we must first grasp the nature of God's promises and warnings concerning the nation of Israel. And this means understanding the, the special relationship that God had with Israel and that God would have with each of us. Understanding the special nature of God's relationship with His people, which is Above all, a spiritual relationship. God's promises, as we will see, as well as His warnings, were conditional. That is, Israel's blessings, its existence as a nation, were conditional upon obedience to God's will. Uh, Israel entered into a covenant relationship with God. A covenant relationship is one in which two parties enter into an agreement where each trusts the other and where specific acts or deeds are promised or anticipated. Uh, we, we all understand this in a sense. Uh, you enter into agreement with the mortgage company over a house that you will pay the principal and the interest and the taxes and the insurance. And if you fulfill your obligations, you will become the owner of that house. I, I remember in 1967, very vividly trading my old Volkswagen in on a new Ford Mustang GT, navy blue with white racing stripes. And I remember the obligation, the commitment that I was bound to, that I came to loathe. And that was $67.93 a month. Those were my car payments, $67.93 for a Mustang GT. 
And I decided then, I will never make car payments again. I will drive an old car if I have to, and save until I can buy a newer one. But that was kind of a, a, a covenant. I, I remember just two years later, standing at the wedding altar and saying something like, I, Donald Evans Balmer, do take thee, Mary Melinda Wheeler, to be my lawful wedded wife, to have and to hold, to love and to cherish, to, in, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, I pledge my troth, my trust, um, and we were married. We were married. That, that could have been a galling yoke. But thank the Lord, he led me to the right person, and it's been a wonderful and, and, and beautiful relationship. God entered into a covenant relationship with his people. And it's most often in scripture compared to a marriage where the husband cherishes his wife, his bride, with all of his heart. And in return, the wife loves her husbands. And they mutually take care of each other's needs and serve each other. And so it has been from the very, very beginning with God and his relationship to those made in his image. From the time of Adam and Eve in the garden, God has been consistent and the conditions have always been the same with his people. Obey and live. Obey by the grace that I bestow upon you and live or disobey and die. And so it was with Israel throughout its history, as recorded in the Old Testament. We're going to look at a number of passages this morning. Uh, it will help me as well as you if you try to follow along. We're going to turn first to Exodus chapter 19, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 6. And we want to see what is God's relationship to Israel, what were his expectations, uh, what was Israel's anticipation, what does history bear out uh, with regard to that relationship. So Exodus chapter 19, and we begin with verse 3, God says to them, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then, and here the pattern is established that we'll see repeated throughout the Old Testament and into the New, if you will then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6, lay out this basic principle. If, if you do this, I will do this for you. And it's a principle that we, we must understand. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we will look at verses 15 through 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. This is Moses speaking to the children of Israel on the very borders of the promised land. Deuteronomy simply means the second giving of the law. It was given first in Exodus. It's repeated here um, in the book of Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy 30, 15, God says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Here are your choices. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to keep His commandments, His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if, there's that little word again, but if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you will surely perish that you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over to the Jordan to go into and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses. Here's legal language, although the covenant relationship far transcended legalities. It had to do with mutual love. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God and obey His voice, that you may cling to Him, for He is your life and your length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you. God gave Israel a land and promised it to them forever. If they would love him with all their hearts and if they would obey him. When I was about eight years old, my parents, based on my promise that I would feed it, bought me a collie dog named Queenie. A beautiful dog. Collies have such sweet natures. And I, I loved that dog. But now remember the condition of my keeping that dog, which was made very clear to me, was that I would feed it, that I would exercise it, that I would care for it. Uh, my parents encouraged me to be faithful to that dog, to keep my promise. Uh, they warned me what could happen if I didn't. And this may seem harsh or cruel, but one day my parents took Queenie and gave her to another. Now, this had nothing to do with my parents' love for me. It had everything to do with their faithfulness to their promises as, as parents. It was a hard, humiliating lesson, but it was a lesson that was absolutely necessary. Do, do you understand? We, we seek to protect our children from the nat natural consequences of their actions. Uh, God will always forgive us, even as my parents forgave me for not taking care of my dog. And they did give me another one that uh, I treated uh, in a more mature way. And I think they were preparing me as best they could for life. And, and so God and his relationship with his people, whether it is the nation of Israel, a special treasure to him, not because they were better. He, in fact, he said, you're smaller. But because he wanted to, uh, to exhibit his glory and his character through them. Uh, or whether it's the Seventh-day Adventist Church or the Los Alamitos Seventh-day Adventist Church 
our spiritual blessings, our existence as a fellowship, depends upon the grace of God and our faithfulness to Him, our response to His goodness to us. I, I'm, I'm going to just refer to some, some verses. This morning, our Sabbath school lesson looked extensively at the book of Judges. Uh, I, when I was preparing this sermon or uh, thinking about giving it, I wasn't thinking of the book of Judges, but the book of Judges is just the perfect illustration of the, the fulfillment of the Deuteronomy principles that we've just described to you. Uh, Israel uh, would disobey and they would get into trouble because they had removed the hedge of protection that God had put around them and trouble would come and they would turn back to God. Their whole experience throughout most of their history ha has been described this way, an eager God and a reluctant people. Uh, God is so eager to bless. God is so eager to do for us more than we can possibly ask or think. But we're so reluctant to follow closely. We're so slow to believe that He will really do all for us that He has promised. I'm so thankful for Cindy's testimony this morning. Let's, um, let's turn to Jeremiah, the seventh chapter. Jeremiah chapter 7, we just had 13 lessons on from Jeremiah during our, um, for our Sabbath school lessons. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 3 through 7. This is much later in Israel's history. They are about to go into captivity, the Babylonian captivity, uh, which would last for 70 years. But God was making one last plea through Jeremiah. In verse 3, Thus says the Lord of hosts and the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Do not trust those who... Uh, do not trust those lying words saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these... It, as, as though God would be saying to us, uh, don't, uh, you know, amend your ways and your doings. I will cause you to dwell in this place. Don't think just because you're a Seventh-day Adventist or a Sabbath keeper or you return your tithes and offerings faithfully that you're safe, that you have everything that you need. Verse 5, for if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, if you do not oppress the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, or walk after other gods to your hurt, then I will cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers, forever and ever. Going on to Jeremiah chapter 18, this is specified so clearly. That is the principle at work. Starting it with verse 5, Jeremiah 18. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter says the Lord. Look, as the day is in, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, to pull down, and to destroy it, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. 
And the instant I speak, I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build up and to plant it. If it, if it does evil in my sight so that it does not obey my voice, then I will relent concerning the good with which I said I would benefit. This is the clearest passage on conditional prophecy. And that it applies even to God's people, to Israel. We read verse 11. Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now, everyone, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. God's promises and prophecies are alike, conditional. And the classic proof is that of Jonah and the city of Nineveh. Do uh, you remember Jonah preached that unless Nineveh repented, God would destroy the city at the end of 40 days. I don't think Jonah even did the if, but he preached that Nineveh would be destroyed. He, he just, you know, I'm sure he said more words than we have recorded in Scripture. But whatever Jonah said, it brought people to repentance. They saw themselves as they really were the evil of their doings, and they repented. They took him seriously. And then God didn't destroy Nineveh because they repented of their evil ways. And the sad end of the story is that Jonah was upset because people would think he was a false prophet because God didn't destroy him. But it's an illustration to us. And don't we understand it in our own everyday lives? When, when we put God first in our lives, where our time is concerned, where our energies are concerned, our interests, our finances, our lives are blessed. We, we get along with each other. We have happy homes. We have wonderful, sweet fellowship in, in the church. But if we put ourselves at the center, and, and like the people in the book of Judges, we all do what is right in our own eyes, we will ultimately suffer the consequences of it. And God seeks loving us so much to shield us from that. Israel didn't repent. So honoring their freedom to say no to him. The heartbroken God of Jeremiah and Jonah allows his children to be led away into exile. He let them reap the inevitable consequences of their choice to live apart from their divine protector and their friend. But even then, and we must move quickly, the heart of divine love refuses to let them go without another chance. And about this time, at, as the 70 years were coming to a close, and Israel would have another opportunity to prove their faithfulness, God raises up Daniel. And you know these familiar verses, starting with verse 24. God gives Israel 70 weeks of years in which to repent. And they're not just ordinary years. Certainly the last seven are not. Because God who had sent prophet after prophet, most of whom were treated pretty roughly, many of them killed, God sends His own Son the Son of God Himself, His divinity clothed with humanity. Jesus comes and walks among men and women. And for three and a half years, for three and a half years, He gives His life and loving service 
to humanity, Jew and Gentile alike. In the midst of that final week, Daniel says the Messiah would be cut off. Jesus died for the sins of his people. And for another three and a half years, the disciples concentrated in giving the gospel message and explaining the significance of Christ's life and death and sacrifice to the children of Israel. But in the end, they stoned Stephen, and at that point, the gospel went to the Gentiles. You know, I've never thought of this before until Sabbath school this morning. That Jesus was not a literal Jew. Did you know that? He had a grandmother that was a Moabitess from Moab. Uh, he had a grandmother who was a harlot in Jericho but who saw the hand of God with the Israelites and repented and became a part of the community of faith. Jesus himself was not a literal Jew. He was, by, uh, in a sense, but uh, it, it just it reminded me how eager God is to be inclusive, to be inclusive. And after, after, his, after his death, and his ascension, his enthronement, the gospel uh, began to go to the, the Gentiles. Um, remember in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, uh, we have these wonderful words, and remember Daniel's prophecy, which indicated the very year that Christ would appear at the Jordan to be anointed as the Messiah. The very year, the very month, the very day, the very hour that he would be crucified. All that is in the book of Daniel. Uh, with wonderful words of Paul, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, born of a virgin. And so Jesus did come. Let's, uh, I, 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 uh, let's, let's turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. Starting with verse 41. Remember the conditionality of God's promises. Remember the coming of Jesus to his own people, his acceptance by the multitudes who heard him gladly, the poor, the vulnerable, but his rejection by the nation as a whole. This happened on the Sunday before his crucifixion. This was his triumphal entry. Luke chapter 19, verse, beginning with verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it saying, if you had known, Jesus sees Jerusalem, the, the temple that he had gone from calling his father's house a house of prayer for all nation to calling it your house. He saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known, if you, even you, especially in this your day, when the fullness of time had come, the things that make for your peace, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies shall build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you, to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You did not know. Matthew chapter 23, 
Matthew chapter 23. The saddest words that Jesus expressed, I believe, um, predicts the ending to Daniel's, Daniel 9's 70th week will come true for that generation. Matthew 23, starting with verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. I would have gathered you, but you were not willing. And here are the faithful words that are at the heart of our study today. See, your house is left to you desolate. The glory has departed. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. On the eve of his own death, Jesus tells a heart-rending parable. Going back just a few pages to Matthew chapter 21, starting with verse 33, Jesus tells the parable of the wicked Vine dressers. He builds a, he plants a vineyard, he builds a tower for its protection. He provides everything that it might be fruitful, that it might be a blessing. But every time he sends, every time he sends uh, laborers to to collect the harvest, they're killed. Verse forty-one. Uh, well. Verse 37, then last of all, he sends his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. This was the very son of God. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the vine dressers? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, and here are the faithful words, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it shall grind him to power. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Jesus said, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And the question this morning is, does Israel as a nation, as a political entity, still have a place in divine prophecy? I think not on the basis of God's Word. All those prophecies that our, all those Old Testament prophecies that our dispensationalist friends are hoping and teaching will yet come literally true, were all conditional. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that reproduce the fruits of the kingdom. 
uh, demonstrating, and we'll close now in just a moment, demonstrating the, the continuity and consistency of God's purpose and plan. Peter the Apostle in his letter, first letter, quotes the very words God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 19 atop Mount Sinai when he declared that the children of Israel would become his people. Only now, Peter applies the promise to a new nation, a new people. Then Peter harkens back to the words of Hosea and again sees as a promise originally made to the nation of Israel and applies it, reapplies it to this new people. And who is this new nation? Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29. I'm sorry, 27 through 29. Verse 6. But you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Throughout the New Testament, the church is the new Israel, the holy nation, the priesthood. Uh, in, there, is only, there is only one people of God, the new Israel. Abraham is our father through faith. If we accept, here's the closing statement, if we accept the New Testament as God's authorized interpretation and authoritative application of the Old Testament, if we let the New Testament explain the Old, we must see the fulfillment of Israel's mission in the continuing mission of the church. The apostolic church considered itself to be the Israel of the messianic age. The New Testament, recogni the, the, the New Testament recognizes holy territory only where Christ is present. Holy territory only where Christ is present even where two or three are gathered together in his name. The biblical focus of prophecy is never on Israel as a nation or political entity, but on Israel as a believing, worshiping covenant people, as the messianic community that continues the work of Christ. Our ultimate focus is not on the nation of Israel, but upon Christ. It's, it is He to whom we look. I was trying to think of, of how to illustrate this, and I was thinking of our fellowship, and the feelings, the sensibilities that we have for each other. Thinking in terms of covenant relationship, thinking in terms of faithfulness, thinking in terms of being believers. You know, some of you, I, I really hardly know. And yet, for some reason, every Sabbath morning, I'm so happy to see you. And if I'm not preoccupied, my face will light up. Uh, there's a preciousness and our bonds that transcends normal human relationships. Is it because I see Jesus in you? Uh, is, is it, is it, does it have to do 
with God's work in our lives. Uh, you know, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're not only we not only have a covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father through Christ and through His Spirit, but we have a sacred relationship to each other. Uh, there's a tenderness, there's a concern, there's, there's a caring that should characterize our fellowship together. And as I see the love in your eyes, and I see uh, your concern for me, even if it's during my sermon and you're saying, Lord, please help the poor preacher. When I see your, when I, when I see your love and kindness and goodwill in your eyes, it speaks to me above all of my Savior's regard. And so may we ever be faithful to Him. May we be uh, the modern Israel, Jews, as we, as we enjoy the faith of Abraham. And whatever happens in the Middle East, and I expect Satan at some time will be active there. I think he's there every day. Um, let us keep our eyes upon Christ and remember His Word. Let's sing in closing just the first and last stanzas of hymn 191. Love divine, all love's excelling. And I chose it, and I really didn't get to it in my sermon, but um, the, the church, the believers, the spiritual Israel are described as God's new creation, and we do so. 191, just the first and last stanzas.